Yeah, let's make a start. I think I'm a minute early, but no one's going to have trouble with that, I don't think. Okay, let's pray. Father, we do praise you for Christ, our mediator, and for his work in applying to us through the Spirit the great work of our salvation. Truly, you are a great God. We bless and magnify your name. And we ask, Lord, that you reveal unto us that powerful work that you have done in us and for us so that we might rejoice and give you all the glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Joey, can I ask you to close the doors, please, sir? Thank you. Okay, if you turn in your Trinity hymnals, if you want to follow along, to page 854, actually 853 and 854, we're going to be concluding chapter 8. We've spent three occasions in chapter 8. It's a significant chapter in terms of its length, uh, also in terms of its... Let's be able to focus, isn't it? That's better. Also in terms of its, its detail, it's a very significant chapter, uh, well worth you going back and rereading, studying, uh, praying through it. Uh, and that's a use for the confession that I think you will find a great blessing that you are able to read through the confession, summary of Scripture, and use it in your prayer times uh, for the worship of God. So we're in chapter 8 of Christ the Mediator. Uh, we've seen Christ's offices in paragraph 1, Christ's natures, paragraph 2 and 3, uh, Christ's qualification for this office, paragraph 3. Then we've moved into redemption accomplished in paragraphs 4 through 7. And paragraph 8, bottom of page, sorry, uh, top of page 854, is redemption applied. Okay, so... Uh, that's the basic outline of, of chapter 8 uh, of the Confession. Again, for those who have just come in, we're working <clears throat> our way through the Confession of Faith, Westminster Confession of Faith, and in your Trinity Hymnal, page 853, and now to page 854, you will find the text, chapter 8, paragraph 8. Just as a reminder, this is our last formal Sunday school for the summer. Come back next week. We've got a very important Sunday school for the life of the church. Um, uh, the deacons and the elders will be presenting uh, the ministries of the church and, and the great opportunities there are for the membership to serve within those ministries. So we'll have a joint Sunday school next week with everyone in here. Uh, but our confession studies stop here for the uh, summer. We'll pick them back up um, again in August, I think, sometime around then. So we're dealing with redemption applied. Those of you who will have done any reading in uh, Reformed theology will know the fellow on the screen. Who is he? John Murray. Good. Who wrote this book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. I believe our deacons are currently working through it in their um, deacons meetings as devotional uh, before, they, um, uh, before they discuss their, their business. So we have before us then the concept of redemption accomplished and applied, and that's really what we see in chapter 8 of our confession of Christ the Mediator, uh, and paragraph 8 speaks to that reality. To all those for whom Christ has purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same. There's the concept of application. Application or communication is the idea of this paragraph. He does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same. Uh, making intercession for them and revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, overcoming all their enemies by his almighty power and wisdom in such manner and ways as are most consonant to his wonderful and unsearchable dispensation. That's the paragraph that is before us. At least I hope it is, because that's what I've prepared work on. Yeah, good. So, that's what's before us. To all those for whom Christ has purchased redemption... 
uh, and we'll have understood previously uh, what that means. Um, he does certainly and effectually apply and communicate the same. Okay, so the application of the work of redemption is then seen in the following ways. Making intercession for them, revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation, effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit, and overcoming all their enemies. That's what the confession, as you see it before you, in broad relief, because bear in mind this is not a, a, a uh, confessions aren't designed to cover every single base uh, and every single scripture. They're broad statements of work. So don't expect to find absolutely everything. But in broad relief, those four elements are the elements of the application of redemption to us. Now let me go back to the paragraph. And I want to ask a general question, if I can, uh, without giving away the answer. When we think of redemption accomplished, who do we think of? Jesus. Yep, Christ Jesus. When we think of de redemption applied, who do we think of? Holy Spirit. What does the confession say? Okay. To all those for whom Christ has purchased redemption, he does certainly and effectually apply. Okay. Now, we come to the Spirit here, okay? So, what we're learning is that the Spirit's role in the application of redemption is but one part of the application of redemption. And that Christ, as prophet, priest, and king, who is sat at the right hand of uh, the Father on high, actually does other things in the application of redemption for us. So, we have Christ and the Spirit working together to apply redemption to us. The redemption that Christ has accomplished is applied both by Christ and by the Spirit. What's the relationship between Christ and the Spirit? I'm thinking in this area now, not, not I don't want a whole <laughs> theology of this, but just in this area. No, that's the area I don't want to go to. You're right, but I don't want to go to that area. Although it does have a relationship, clearly, to what we're speaking of now. Um, the Spirit, we read in, I think it's Second Peter 1, is called the Spirit of Christ. Okay? And who sends, and this is linking to what Scott has just said, the Spirit proceeding from Father and Son. Who sends the Spirit? Father and Son. Right, Okay. So again, we're very much into Trinitarian theology. Okay, very important that we remember our faith is a Trinitarian faith. Uh, I'm, I'm, I've said it before, I'm very thankful for the emphasis upon the work of Christ and, and what's known now as Christ-centered preaching. That's very good. But it mustn't be at the expense of Father and Spirit. Okay? It can't just be Jesus and you. Um... We'll see that tonight as well in the evening worship. So, these are our four areas of um, the application of the work of redemption. Let me just read you a few of the scriptures that we have before you there. Making intercession for them is one of the works of Christ in the application of redemption. 1 John 2 verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, okay? Again, Romans 8.34. I'm not going to read every one because of time constraints. Um, uh, Romans 8.34 is explicit. Jesus is sat at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So part of the application of redemption is Christ's intercession. We'll come back to that in a moment. The second work is revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation, Ephesians 1, 7 through 9, in him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. That idea of revelation, revealing unto us the mystery of his will. 
effectually persuading them by his spirit to believe and obey. Now, just because it only speaks about the spirit there doesn't mean that the spirit is not involved, for example, in the second and in the first also. But the spirit uh, intercedes for us, although there's an interesting interpretation of that that we'll come to another time. Um, But he is also involved in the revealing unto us, is he not, of the mysteries of salvation. It's the spirit working with the word in us, whereby those mysteries are revealed. But here the Spirit is explicitly spoken of, cited in John 14, 16 and Romans 8, 9. Our Lord says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. Romans 8, 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Okay. And then also uh, the fourth item, overcoming all their enemies. Uh, is an aspect of the reign of Christ. That's where we think of Christ as king. Christ overcoming our enemies. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a stool for your feet. And then 1 Corinthians 15 also, he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. That's in broad relief the work that uh, uh, is involved in the application of redemption. We've got a little bit of time, not much, just to drill down into each one of these. The idea of effectually applying and communicating the same. Well, first of all, we have to understand what the same is. Well, the same is the substance of, of everything we've read in the whole chapter and what comes in this chapter itself. So just like any other text that is before us, we always read, especially scripture, we always read in context what is being read. Uh, Shorter Catechism question 29 speaks to this matter. How are we made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ? We are made partakers of the redemption purchased by Christ by the effectual application of it to us by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so The catechism is qualifying what it says, and it's often the case, both shorter and larger, will qualify what is found in the confession. And sometimes the confession will qualify what's found in the catechism. But the point I want to make here is the effectual application of it to us. Listen to A.A. Hodge uh, in his work on the system of theology contained in the shorter catechism opened and explained he writes the scriptures teach that men are by nature spiritually dead in trespasses and sins that we cannot turn from sin unto god except we are first drawn by god the salvation therefore which christ has wrought for us must be applied to us by the mighty power of god the work of the holy spirit is in us just as essential as the work of Christ for us. Let me say that again. The work of the Holy Spirit in us is just as essential as the work of Christ for us. And in the first instance, in the first instance, we are no more able to cooperate in the work of the Spirit applying redemption than we are able to cooperate with the atoning work of Christ meritoriously effecting redemption. Okay, there's a lot there, uh, but the point is this. Naturally, we are unable to respond to the grace of God. Remember, that takes us back earlier to the statement about um, uh, not only the doctrine of Scripture, but God's covenants, that it took, the gap between us and God was so great, it took an act of condescension. That was before the fall. How much more condescension does it take, in a sense, for God to reach down and have relationship with us in our state of sin? Uh, in like manner, uh, that's what Hodge and the Shorter Catechism is, Catechism is citing here, that it takes the work of God uh, for uh, us to enjoy any fruition of our God. So we understand we're dealing not just with the Spirit, we're dealing with Christ and the Father. The Father sends the Son, The Son accomplishes redemption, and the Spirit, along with Christ, but the Spirit applies redemption to us. That's to say we cannot have salvation without the Father sending, without the Son accomplishing, without the Spirit 
applying. What does that make salvation? Trinitarian. Excellent. Trinitarian. We have a relationship then with each person of our triune God as well as the triune God. Okay, it's very important we understand this. I fear we've lost something, especially of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in, in many Reformed churches. We, we've perhaps been fearful of overreacting to, or, or, or we've been fearful of the dangers of the uh, errors of perhaps the charismatic movement. Also within the Reformed world, there's that strain of, of, of Christ and Christ alone to the exclusion of Father and Spirit. And I fear we've lost something when we uh, do not do justice to the person and work of the Spirit. And when I understand the Holy Spirit a little bit better, I'll preach a sermon series on it, on him, not it, him. Hodge again writes this, the power used by the Holy Ghost in our effectual calling is always efficacious. Its effect is called regeneration or the new birth. It is the exercise of the mighty power of God directly upon the soul, quickening it to a new spiritual life. It is a single act of God, the Holy Ghost. The effect once produced is preserved forever by the continued indwelling of the Holy Ghost in our hearts. The change, change wrought, uh, yes, the change wrought affects the whole soul, the intellect, the affections and will, and all their faculties. Questions or comments? Jim. Well, my flippant response is, well, chapter 13 is the chapter on sanctification, so there's your distinction. But um, uh, I, I think uh, inevitably there is overlap. Let me come back to that for a moment, because actually I'm going to kind of address that in a, in a roundabout way. Let me come back to that in a moment. Clearly there's overlap there. Clearly. Okay? So how is that redemption applied? So we've spoken generally about the work of the Spirit, the work of Christ. Let's move quickly to these uh, four items. There's your scriptures there. Uh, Christ makes intercession for us. Uh, we've got the language there of advocacy in 1 John 2 and intercession uh, in Romans 8. 34. The language of advocacy is the Greek word parakleton, from which, of course, we understand the word paraclete, uh, comforter, counselor, advocate, as is translated in various different places. William Hendrickson says, an advocate is one who speaks with the Father in our defense. That's Christ applying the work of redemption to us, speaking to the Father on our behalf, as it were, in our defense. Christ is our advocate, uh, the personally and perfectly righteous one. Uh, as the Messiah also, he rules over heaven and over earth, and he has fulfilled the law's demands both positively and negatively. We could go on speaking about the qualities of Christ, but that'll have to suffice to show that the one who is our advocate, is perfectly suited and qualified for that role. There's always a problem, is there not, with human advocates. They, they can't fully enter in to the experience and life, uh, the emotions of the one for whom they are advocating. That's just the reality. Here's the advocate, here's the one who, who needs advocacy. They're two different people. But Christ, we're told in Scripture, it is fully qualified, fully able. He even sympathizes with our griefs, having been made like unto us. That's to say then, it's a great comfort, we have one who is sat at the right hand of the Father, who is able and is qualified to fully intercede on our behalf. Notice also the position from where Christ intercedes. Uh, as we read... Um, 
in Romans 8. He's at the right hand of God. Now that speaks of a kingly function uh, in intercession. He's the mediatorial king. And as king, he's also the judge. And as the judge, he stands at God's right hand, making intercession for those who would otherwise be judged. So scripture portrays both father and son in different respects as judge. And normally you have the accused, the advocate, and the judge. Well, in this case, the judge is also our advocate, which is a remarkable thing to say. Uh, Not only does this advocacy speak of his kingly role also, it speaks clearly of his high priestly office also. Here's our Christ, our great king, and our great high priest advocating on our behalf. That's the first way in which Christ's redemption, which he purchased in life, death, resurrection, and ascension, is applied to us. Christ, seated at the right hand of God, has both a legal and a brotherly interest in us. A legal and a brotherly interest in us. And there's those two points before you there. Any questions? To be very quick. Okay. Moving on. Revealing unto them in and by the word the mysteries of salvation. Here are two of the texts uh, that are spoken. Speak to this matter. So we think then, well, Okay, we are having to, having to us, having revealed unto us, sorry, the mysteries of salvation. How does this form part of Christ's mediatorial work? How does this form part of the application of redemption? Well, when you think about it, it's very obvious. To us is being revealed the intricacies and complexities and the glories of what God has done for us. Christ is revealing them to us in the Word, through the work of His Spirit. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. I'm putting it up on the board for you. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom. So notice that there. That's the idea of being revealed to us, the impartation of wisdom. Although it is not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of the age understand this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Okay, the revelation of such to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. I'm not going to read on. I think you get the idea. Part of the work of redemption or the application of redemption to us is this idea that we are receiving through the Spirit wisdom from God, insight, understanding about the work of, uh, of God from, from, from creation to the new creation and everything in between. That's God applying Christ's redemption in each of your lives. As you come to church and you sit in the ministry of the word, as, you, as, as we pray, as we sing the hymns and psalms of the faith, as you sit in your homes reading the word of God, that is Christ by his spirit applying his work of redemption to your hearts. Sealing it, as it were, upon your hearts. Making you personally and us as a church better acquainted with what God has done for us. So Christ's done it historically at the cross. Death, life, death, resurrection, ascension. How does that get into our hearts? It's 
by this. It's by the Spirit taking the Word. It's by Christ sending His Spirit so that the truths of the gospel and, in fact, of the whole counsel of God may be impressed upon your hearts. It's pretty remarkable when you think about it, isn't it? It gives us another dimension, in a sense, to what we do when we sit down to read our scriptures at home. We find it such a a trial or a chore because we've got so many other things that we know we need to do and to pray. Ah, but that's Christ applying his work to each one of you individually. That's remarkable, I think. Thirdly, another thing that happens in the application of the work of redemption, uh, that there's an effectual persuading of them by his spirit to believe and obey and governing their hearts by his word and spirit. Oh, I'm going, going too far ahead from it. So this effectual persuading again comes up. Now we need to go back to 1 Corinthians 2.14 about uh, some of the things we read. Natural man does not accept that which is spiritual. Remember that passage? They're folly to him. He's not able to understand um, because they're spiritually discerned. That's to say, the natural man without Christ cannot have any blessing of God apart from that which is common to all people. There is no spiritual blessing ultimately to natural man because there is a total inability of natural man to achieve saving knowledge by his own ends or merits. But the work of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit is effectual. So we have then uh, in our confession and more importantly in Scripture, uh, the glorious truth that when God gives His Spirit to someone, the Spirit works in them to give them a new heart, uh, to change them, to transform them radically so that they're no longer of the flesh but they're of the Spirit. And you can see that in Romans 8 9 there. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. It is an effectual work. It accomplishes what it intends. Just as God says in Isaiah, he sends his word forth, and it will not return to me void. It will accomplish all for that he has ordained it. So when the Spirit works, he works. It is effectual. It does change. And many of you can bear witness to that change yourselves. I hope all of us can. You know the reality. Once you're in darkness, now you're in light. And that's the work of the Spirit. What is that work? Chiefly here, what we're reading of is firstly regeneration, or as Hodge said, it was called the new birth. Now, which chapter of the confession is about regeneration? Don't look or cheat. Which chapter in the confession is on regeneration? I'm glad none of you know the answer, because there is no chapter on regeneration. Trick question. You all win. Well done. Actually, there is a uh, chapter on regeneration. It's just not called that. If you look at chapter 10, the doctrine of regeneration is dealt with both in chapter 8, what we've spoken of now, and also under uh, effectual calling. So effectual calling, we'll get to that in, in, in September probably. Um, that's where the doctrine of regeneration comes in. Now, this goes back to Jim's question earlier. This sounds rather like sanctification. Well, it would, because regeneration and sanctification are, in a sense, two sides of the same coin. They're not the same. They are theologically distinct, but there's a significant overlap between the two. Uh, In regeneration, the new birth, unless one is born from above, as our Lord says, John 3, uh, that's the beginning of the process of becoming a Christian. So regeneration is the Spirit's sovereign, powerful, effectual work, transforming people uh, from, uh, I think I'm going to mention this tonight, actually, uh, um, Ezekiel 36, removing a heart of stone, giving a heart of flesh, I think Jeremiah speaks of God writing with a, a, a pen, with, a, with a, a, a tip of diamond, the law upon our hearts. That, that's regeneration. It's the transformation from, 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 from darkness and unbelief and a disposition to unbelief to 
uh, uh, an ability by God's grace to receive faith, which is also the gift of God. So, regeneration, faith, we could go through the Ordo Salutis, but then we are by faith united to Christ, we are justified, adopted, and we are sanctified, which you'll see is the order there of the confession. Chapter 10, effectual calling, in which faith will also come, as well as regeneration. Then there's justification, adoption, sanctification, or a saving faith is after that, which is interesting. Um, and you could you could put all those things together in what we call union with Christ. When we're united to Christ, we receive what Christ is. So in answer to Jim's question, there's a good reason why it sounds like sanctification, because the work of regeneration or conversion is, in a sense, in a sense, carried on in sanctification. So that as we are granted a new heart with new desires, the Spirit takes those new desires and shapes them more. It is God who works in you, both to will, that's to desire, and to do His good pleasure. And that kind of starts with regeneration, conversion, saving faith, and sanctification. Does that answer the question, Jim? Yeah, very good. Um, what we have here, we haven't really got time. Oh, we're out of time already. Um... What you've got in this one especially is, is the mechanics of the Spirit's work. Not in terms of how the Spirit does it, but what He does. Effectually persuading them by His Spirit to believe and obey. Governing their hearts by His Word. Very important to have a heart governed by the Word of God. The heart is, is the seat of your emotion and passion in Scripture. And if your heart is not governed by Scripture, uh, then it's governed by the world. And your mind will be a product of that, and what you say will be a product of that ungoverned heart. So, you'll notice how Christ works through His Spirit uh, in their hearts by His Word and Spirit. Word and Spirit belong together. Let me finish very quickly the last one, overcoming overcoming all their enemies. And you see the scriptures there that speak to that. First, uh, Psalm 110 and uh, 1 Corinthians 15. What you have here then is another picture of Christ in his kingly office. The eternal reign of Christ and the providential reign of Christ defeating his and our enemies, which is the language of the Shorter Catechism. Okay? That's the application of redemption to us when our enemies are cast down. Preferably by the gospel. But if not by the gospel, then by whatever means God chooses. Uh, and secondly, the destruction of death. That's an application of Christ's work to you as he overcame death. Because you are united to him by faith, you also will overcome death. Our response, not just worship Christ, worship our triune God. Because the work of redemption and even the work of the application of redemption is a work of the triune God. All right, so we have Father, Son, and Spirit active and at work in our lives. And I'm pretty sure we need a better comprehension of all three persons and their work individually and as one. Secondly, uh, be assured of God's work. That word effectual uh, or effective kept coming up. Most of you this morning are struggling in your lives in one way or another with, with perhaps some besetting sins, just struggles that you've had for many years. Uh, in a sense, that's entirely natural and to be expected in the Christian life. Uh, because the Holy Spirit is working with sovereign power, it is not right for us to despair in those issues. It is actually right for us to have great confidence, not in ourselves, but in Almighty God, that He will sanctify us. First Thessalonians 4, this is the will of God, your sanctification. Okay, it's very important we understand that. Now, you have a role to play in sanctification, 
Not like justification, but in sanctification you do. You've got to read your Bible by faith and pray, but pray by faith. Principally those things. Um, as you do so, the work of redemption is being applied to you in a, a kind of cleansing and practical sense. Your hearts and minds are being put back on the rails after they've been derailed by sin. We have great assurance that God works in that. And so we labor in the strength of the Spirit to be disciples of Christ. Disciples uh, in the Word. Okay, that's the instrument by which the Spirit works chiefly. That's to say the Spirit can, because He's sovereign God, work outside of the ordinary means if He so chooses, but the principal means by which the Spirit works uh, is the Word. So be in the Word. Even when you don't feel like it, be in the Word. And be in prayer. Especially when you don't feel like it, be in prayer. These are the means that God has chosen by which the work of Christ will be imprinted and sealed upon your heart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pink, I almost said it in the sermon today, I quoted Pink negatively. Um, pink is equally brilliant and um, equally imaginative in his exegesis. So just be a little bit bit, bit careful with Pink. Some of his biblical theology is astonishingly good. But he can get a bit fanciful at times, but he's one of my regulars I use, so uh, I've not read his work on the Spirit, so maybe I need to. Any other questions? Denise, yeah, very quickly. <gasps> You're not allowed to do that, sorry. Yes. No, I said not not justification. Yeah. Quite right. Uh, yes, but you you would have to acknowledge that there is a difference. I think between. Look, sanctification is by grace as well, perfectly, absolutely. Uh, I'm talking about the instruments, not the causes. Uh, all of salvation is divine cause. Um, uh, and, and so we need to be very clear on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. I think the difference um, between justification and sanctification, you can see the difference in the, um, in the shorter catechism questions. Very clearly, they, they elucidate a different role for um, for us, um, and, and so I, I think I'm happy with what I said. Um, I'm not on justification and sanctification at the moment, but uh, we would want to very much affirm a top-down model of justification, and also a top-down model of sanctification. Yes, but we play a role in that sanctification. It's an instrumental role. It's an instrumental cause, not, not a fundamental cause, but it is an instrumental. Um, the Christian who wants to be sanctified will never be sanctified by doing nothing. That's, that's all I'm getting at. Without adding any causal aspect to that. Daisy. Yes, very much so. Yes, it would. Christ is, uh, Christ is our sanctification, 1 Corinthians 1.30. And that must surely speak not only to, the, um, uh, not only to the, an ongoing process, but actually principally to a one-off event. We are holy, 
even though there are remnants of unholiness still within us. Uh, so we have what some theologians will call a definitive sanctification, a once and for all holiness, just as we are righteous, we are holy in the sight of God. But then in God's grace and, and, and wisdom, we are never more justified than we are when we were first believed. We sing that hymn, more happy but not more secure, the glorified spirits in heaven. They're more happy because they're free from sin, but they're not more secure, even though we're still down here. Um, but in sanctification, there's that practical ongoing element. Yes, certainly, that's very helpful. We're not in sanctification, so um, th this is a discussion we'll have then, no doubt. Um, but yes, we do in a practical sense, Lord willing, grow in grace, grow in holiness. And our sanctification is incomplete in time. So that's going down another road, but good, good contributions from everyone there. Thank you. Got no more time, I'm afraid. We're already seven minutes over. I'm doing an irvan. <laughs> All right, let's close in prayer. Our great God, we thank you. We bless your name for Christ, our mediator, for you, our triune God, who has called us, sent your Son, and the Spirit who works mightily in us. Lord, we do pray that you will open our minds to the glories which you are revealing to us, that we might grow in grace, we might grow in love and in trust for you, that we might always set Christ before us. Lord, how we pray that in the quietness of our own homes and lives, our profession of faith will match that which we exhibit in public before others. Work mightily in us, Lord God, we pray for Christ's sake and for your glory. Amen.